<laughs> can I can I complain for a little bit? Can I get a little whiny? My wife does not like to listen to me whine, so I'm thinking maybe all of you will. And I'm just going to take your silence for an agreement. It's okay. So I've had a bit of a tough go lately. And the other day I was looking at my wife and I just said, when are we going to catch a break? When are we going to catch a break? So it all began last fall when my wife got really sick. Just out of the blue, no reason, don't know why, like really, really sick. And, and finally, we kind of figured it out, but we still weren't 100% sure. But she recovered. And then shortly after she recovered, you might remember, I was cleaning the driveway, fell backwards on my ankle and snapped it. And, and then spent the next six weeks in a cast, basically useless. And then after that, we uh, got a, a, a roof, a leak in our roof, the, the sunroom just water started pouring in where it shouldn't be. And, and so we had to replace that and replace the door. And, and so we're taking lines of credit, trying to pay, pay all that off. And then after that, we started hearing about this thing called COVID-19. I don't know if you've heard of it. And the world just went crazy. And then I thought, you know what? I, I'm going to get my trailer. I'm going to bring it up to a site this summer so we have a place to go. We can isolate at home. We can isolate up there in nature. I'm going to bring it up there, and I'm so excited. And I've always wanted to put my trailer on a permanent site, just kind of make a little home in Muskoka, just outside Huntsville. And I, and I plug in the water. I'm getting everything ready, and, and the bottom of the trailer just starts filling up with water. And, and so I'm like, what do I do? I had to go underneath and cut the canvas off the bottom of the trailer and, and rip out the insulation to find that the water lines had all been chewed by rodents, every single one. And so I'm kind of freaking out and my father-in-law and I go up there and we spend a whole day there, we replace a couple lines, we think we've got it and then we find there's more and there's more. Finally, I call an expert, he comes up and, and he replaces like 80 feet of lines charges me 1200 bucks for it, which, which I don't have. And then I'm like, okay, good. It's fixed. It costs a lot of money. I go up to the trailer this weekend only to find that the lines they'd replaced on Monday had all been chewed up again. So I rem remember when that happened, just looking at my wife and saying, when are we going to catch a break? Do you ever feel that, that way? Like, like just one thing after another. And it's like you recover from one calamity or maybe you're still even in it. And then another thing happens. I know I'm not the only one. I also know that a lot of your problems run deeper than my busted up trailer. Now there's a t temptation when, when these kind of things happen to have responses that maybe aren't so healthy. Maybe to get angry at God. You know, sometimes maybe getting angry at God is good. I think God can take our anger sometimes. The Psalms often seem to direct some of that at God. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not God who's doing any of this to me. So really, that's not a healthy way of dealing with it. I could become depressed. And I have had a couple moments in my life where I've experienced depression. It's a pretty terrible thing. And it's something I want to work really hard to stay out of. Another reaction could be to turn to things to kind of lift my spirits, but maybe not in a healthy way, like, like a bad habit or, or just something like eating way too much hamburgers and pizza, which I've kind of done over this COVID time, maybe pursuing unhealthy relationships. We all kind of have those things that when life is kind of stinky that, that we pursue because we feel like it'll fill that void. It'll lift us up. A lot of the times, we're not talking about reading the Bible or prayer. We're talking about things that are maybe unhealthy and unproductive for us. You see, I've come to learn over the years that we write songs in our heads. We, we kind of latch on to a lyric and we repeat it over and over again. Do you ever get a song stuck in your head, but only just like one portion of a song? Or maybe a, a, a jingle for a commercial, like a serial, like... Um, you know, when you were a kid, a Lucky Charms or whatever, and 
and it just plays over and over again. Well, I've kind of been playing this song over and over again. It, the lyrics go something like this. When will I catch a break? When will I catch a break? That's a song that I've been singing recently. And, and like my dog used to wear a path in the backyard as he circled around and around the yard, the song settles deeper and deeper into my mind and into my spirit. And it begins to actually shape everything I do so that at the end of it all, this song is just playing on an endless loop. And I am just looking for ways to reinforce the message of that song. When will I catch a break? Maybe, maybe in times of trouble, maybe in times of distress, maybe when we find the song that we're singing is just not helpful, maybe it's time for a new song. I turned to the Psalms this week as I was thinking about worship in the context of COVID-19 and social isolation and, and, and thinking about this idea of needing a new song. And we find that very phrase in Psalm 40. I'm sure you know this one. This is a Psalm of David. It's a poem or probably a song that would have been written by David and sent to the choir master. And it begins this way. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. So here we have David in a situation and we don't really know. People can guess what the situation is. It doesn't really matter. All we need to know is that David is in a place where he's like, when will I catch a break? Everything just seems to have gone sideways for him in this moment. And, and he's crying out to God, looking for help. Now, I was reading in a commentary by Walter Brueggemann, and he said that, that actually what we find here is an infinitive absolute in the Hebrew. So with an infinitive absolute, actually a better translation instead of I waited patiently for the Lord would be, I hope intensely for Yahweh. So what we find in our Bibles is perhaps maybe just a little bit too gentle of an expression. I, I hope intensely for Yahweh. Have you ever been in that kind of place where, where you just looked around at your life at the smoking rubble and you're just like, God, I need you, God. I need you. Yahweh is the, the name of God. Yohei, um, Vavhe. Yahweh translated the Lord often just, God, Yahweh, I need you. I need you intensely in this moment more than any other time. I need you. And that's how David begins this psalm. He inclined to me, David said, and he heard my cry. We know that at certain points in David's life, he definitely would have dealt with things a little bit differently. He probably wouldn't have sought the Lord in his time of need. And we know this because, well, Second Samuel exists, and it tells us about a time when David was kind of getting complacent and he didn't go off to war as he normally would, and he stayed at home and he was kind of up to no good. And one evening he got up from his bed, he walked around the roof of the palace, and he saw a woman bathing. She was very beautiful. Her name was Bathsheba, and we know the very famous story that, that came out of that. Here we have an example of, of David. Whatever the song was that was in his mind, in that time, whatever that lyric was that was playing, and, and, and we don't know what it is, but it was one that kind of drove him up to the roof to look for an unhealthy way to sate that emotion that was going on within him. But when we come to Psalm 40, I'm going to guess that we're going to find a David who's a little bit more mature, who's learned from his lessons and he knows that, that it will only be a temporary, fleeting pleasure to pursue anything else in a moment like this than God. And so he continues in the psalm, and I think we're finding his wisdom of a lifetime lived in the Lord. Psalm 40, verse 2, he drew me up 
from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. There's a a bit by comedian John Mulaney, and he talks about quicksand. And he says that when he was a kid, he thought that quicksand would be more of a big deal than it turned out to be when he grew up. And, and I don't know, Jerry, you might be able to relate to this. Like every cartoon in the 80s, there was quicksand. Eventually, Scooby-Doo and the gang were going to fall into it. Even I think Optimus Prime got stuck in quicksand at one point. I mean, I just grew up, and John Mulaney pointed this out, thinking that when I was an adult, like, I get a text, hey, you might want to avoid Highway 12 because there's quicksand on Highway 12 today, and you don't want to get stuck. Turns out as an adult, quicksand isn't really a big deal, but the image here is similar. David's saying, I was stuck. I, I, was, I was chest deep in a miry bog. Have you ever been stuck in mud? I've been stuck in mud. It's kind of a helpless feeling. Well, that's the image that David gives us. He's in a place where he's stuck, and God reaches down, picks him up, and sets him on solid ground. What what a beautiful, beautiful image we have here. Do you need that today? Do you feel stuck? Have you exhausted every other avenue, every other tactic to free yourself? Then here's my suggestion. Just let go. Just let go. You know, sometimes we need to let go of the things that are keeping us stuck in order to allow the Lord to pick us up out of that situation and place us on solid ground. I remember one time I was backpacking and I got into some really deep mud. And and I got a few feet in and I was trying to get back out. And I quickly realized that there was only one way that I was getting out of that mud. I'm sure you've guessed it. I had to reach down, unlace my boots, and have a friend pull me out, right out into my socks. That was the only way I was getting free of this situation. And friends, sometimes there's things in our lives that have us stuck like glue. And we need to unlace those boots and let them go. Whatever that is, whether it's whether it's an unhealthy thought in our head, whether it's an unhealthy relationship, whether it's an unhealthy avenue of feeding that emptiness within us, whether, whatever it is, it's personal to you. Only you deep down in your soul know what those things are. Whatever it is, unlace those boots and let God pick you up and pull you out to safety. When we let go of the things that get us stuck, like shame or jealousy or fear or greed, and we ask God to write us a new song, it's amazing how God can change our outlook. Psalm 40, verse 3, David says, So he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God, and many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Now, dear church, this is why worship is is so important in the difficult times as well as the good, but most especially in the difficult times. And I think that's because what worship does is it refocuses us on all of the right things. You know, there is so much trying to drag you down. There are are negative ideas, negative people. There are social systems. Everything is trying to drag us back, it seems, at times. And worship, worship cuts through all of that. It cuts through all the negativity, all of the garbage, all of those those lies and deceptions and falsehoods. And it cuts right through all of that to give you a vision of our holy God, our righteous King and Lord. You know, Paul gives us advice in this vein in his letter to the Philippians. 
He says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And so you might envision a beautiful sunset or a verse from the Bible or whatever it is that's praiseworthy, whatever it is that's noble or true or lovely. But let me ask you, what is more true or noble or right or pure or admirable or excellent or praiseworthy than God? Right? Really, Paul is telling us to focus, to dwell on, to think about God. Worship, dear church, is an expression of praise and, and trust in God. It's, it's an expression of our love relationship with God as we walk that journey with him, as he speaks into our lives, as we bring our cares and everything to him. Worship is a response to who God is. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Think of worship as worth-ship, worth-ship. Really, the whole goal of worship is to tell God what we think about him, how much we love him, how wonderful he is to us. It's an expression of the soul that, that has experienced the saving presence of God and says, thank you for who you are, and thank you for what you've done. And worship, dear friends, is therefore the antidote for fear, for helplessness. It's the antidote for the quicksand of negativity because it focuses us on something so far bigger than ourselves. And that thing is not only huge and powerful, but also kind and loving and seeks to pull us out of the mire and the muck in which we are stuck and set us on solid rock. But here's the thing, so often we make worship all about ourselves. And I think David understood this. We, we so often make it about ourselves. How many worship songs do we sing that, that focus on us more than it does on God? If we sing a worship song and it keeps on about I, 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 me, 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 and there's very little God. And when it mentions God, it's only because God does, loves me or has done something for me. Friends, that might not be a worship song at all. Or perhaps the subject or the object of the worship, sorry, is the wrong person. Not God, but me. Here's a principle I'd like you to take with you today. Worship should focus on God. When we, when we gather for worship, and, and now this is not a normal gathering for worship, but picture when we all get back into your sanctuary, whether it's here at Knox or in Hillsdale or in Victoria Harbor or wherever you might be, <clears throat> when we all gather together for worship again. And, and Jerry's up at the front, your music leader's up at the front, and they're singing a worship song, and you're sitting in a pew who is the audience? Who is the audience in that moment? Now, you might be tempted to think that the audience are you, the pew. And we actually kind of talk that way. Like, ah, oh, the band was really good today. They really motivated me. They sounded great. They really spoke to me. You do the same with a sermon. A sermon didn't speak to me. didn't feed me. That sermon was great. really fed me. As if, as if the congregation is the audience. And then God's just kind of spectating up, up there in the sky. That's a vision of worship that we have, but it's not an appropriate one. It's not a healthy one. When we gather in worship church, God is the audience. And, and, and we, all of us, the person with the guitar or behind the drums and every person in the pew, we are the choir singing Praises to our God. This is, this is the truest form of worship in this kind of context. 
where we are not the focus, where it's all about God, who he is, how beautiful he is, how wonderful he is, how powerful he is, how truth-giving he is, how mercy-giving he is, how loving he is, how kind he is, how patient. That's the focus of our worship. Worship that focuses on us isn't really worship at all. David understood this. He talks about how much God loves us and how God provides for us, but primarily he sings about how great and awesome God is. He continues in verse 5, You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to proclaim the things you've done. I'm going to tell everybody about them. And yet they are more than can be told. Notice that when David does focus on what God has done for him, he does so, and this is really interesting, whenever it's about him, like God has done this for me, he talks about it because he wants to say, I'm then going to pass on to everyone I've met what you have done for me so that they too can give you glory for your kindness and your generosity, your compassion and your love. It's really interesting. David says, I will we'll proclaim and I'll tell of the things you've done. And again, in verse two, we read, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. Like, God, you pulled me up out of the muck. You put me on the ground. And some people are like, great, let's just leave it right there. But, but he says, I'm not going to hide that in my heart. I'm going to speak of your faithfulness. I'm going to speak of your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. You see, worship is also an evangelistic tool. You know, people, they watch and they observe how we react under pressure. If the song that we are singing is, everything stinks, if the song that we are singing is, people stink, if the song that we are singing is, this world is going to hell in a handbasket, then why in the world would I want to join a people like that? Why in the world would I want to worship a God like that? But if the song we sing is, next slide, buddy. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Well, that, dear friends, in a time like this, is a song that I want to sing. So, instead of singing, when will I catch a break? I'd like to rewrite those lyrics. Maybe I should sing a new song. Maybe the song is about how my wife got better or how when I broke my ankle, Carrie Ann picked Paxton up and took him to daycare for two weeks. Or how maybe I was stuck inside for three months, but I was stuck inside where I was safe and warm and well fed. Maybe I could sing a song about how my camper might be broken, but my spirit is not. Maybe my song could be about how God pulled me up out of the quicksand and put me on solid ground. That through it all, God was with me, guiding, consoling, healing, and providing. Yes, I think it's time that I ask God to put a new song in my mouth, a new song of praise in my heart to my God. You know, during quarantine, we have had to reevaluate our understanding of what it means to be a worshiping community. I mean, we literally cannot gather together anymore, and yet we still claim that we continue to worship our God. And that's because the object of our worship is not found in the sanctuary on Sunday morning. The object of our worship is our God who is everywhere at all times. And so we can worship him anywhere at all times. In quarantine, we have had to ask the question, who are we in isolation? 
And the answer is, we are a people who hope intensely for Yahweh. We are a people who have been given a new song. A song of hope, a song of love, a song of deliverance. So, what is your song? If it is anything other than this, perhaps it is time to ask the Lord for a new one. Let us pray.